I welcome you all to this forum. I'm David Theo Goldberg, the director of the University of California Humanities Research Institute, this forum on Saeed's Palestine. We have people with us from over two dozen countries and sites globally. So we're thrilled to have you join us. I hope wherever you are, you are safe and well. I wanna thank our dear friend and colleague, Judith Butler for moderating the panel and the wonderful group of people for, uh, from whom we are about to hear. Uh, Nadara Shalhub Kavorkin in Jerusalem, Nadia Abu Al Haj in New York, Sari Makdisi and Esmat Al Halabi here in California. Cheers too for UCHRI staff, so tirelessly for working to host our forum, and to the two ASL interpreters, Bob Leparo and Arlene Navayas. We also have a live transcript on, which you can turn off at the bottom of your Zoom page which um, uh, if you click on it, you, there are uh, settings that you can turn off, although it's pretty accurate. We will leave the last 25 minutes or so for audience questions. So please pose questions throughout to the Q&A where our, sta our staff will curate them for our moderator. The cover of the latest Economist has the Palestinian and Israeli flags split into color panels interspersed with each other. The online digital version starts with the two flags more or less overlapping and then dissolving into the bands of color interspersed with each other. <clears throat> the blurb for the lead article reads, the two state process is barring the route to peace in some version of a common state with equal rights for all. The unraveling of formal apartheid ramped up in something like this way. After 1976, the, um, after 1976 and increasingly in the 1980s, the global investment community turned on South Africa and started warming to boycotts and sanctions, calling for change alongside and driven by the significant on the ground and global struggles. This is not to say that the two formations are exactly isomorphic, but histories reveal it is why we do the work we do. I don't think it's too strong to say that something significant is shifting. For something like four decades, Edward Said offered us cogent terms of analysis for the historical and contemporary social conditions he cared about alike. From, and this is a very partial list, Orientalism to the question of Palestine and after the last sky, Palestinian lives. From culture and imperialism to the end of the peace process, and to humanism and democratic cr uh, criticism, not to mention additional work aplenty, including Zionism from the standpoint of its victims, in which he also insists that criticism of Israel as such is not to be reduced to anti-Semitism, to which he was explicit in objecting repeatedly throughout the years. Fueled in part by the recent volume by Tim Brennan on Sayyid's life and work, we thought it would be terrifically generative at this time to think with Said and have his work think with us on the pressing issue of what and where now, Palestine. As Said comments incisively, and I quote, the intellectual is perhaps a kind of counter memory with his own counter discourse that will not allow conscience to look away or fall asleep, end quote. Even in his modest, even in his most heated, not just modest, in his most heated exchanges, I think here of those with Michael Walzer, for instance, not to wince at those with Bernard Lewis, where on these issues, Sid was Said was largely courageously alone in the academy and much of American and European public intellectual exchange. He set the example of remaining always dignified and respectful, even when at his most cuttingly critical. Tensions are now running high around concerns about Palestine and Israel. Imposing questions or expressing criticisms, we urge living up to the example Edward Sayed has endearingly bequeathed us. I turn now to introduce uh, Judith Butler, who will be our moderator. Judith will then introduce the panelists. Judith Butler is Maxine Elliott Professor Emerita in the Department of Comparative Literature and the Program of Critical Theory at the University of California, Berkeley. She served as a founding director of the Critical Theory Program and the International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs at UC Berkeley and internationally. She's the author of a very long list of books, so I won't um, repeat them all, but they include Parting Ways, 
Jewishness and the Critique of Zionism in 2012, Dispossession, the Performative in the Political, co-authored with Athena Athanasio in 2013, Senses of the Subject, a note towards a performative theory of assembly in 2015, and a co-edited volume, Vulnerability and Resistance, 2015. Her most recent book, The Force of Nonviolence, I think it's the most recent, I, I cannot quite keep up. Um, the Force of Nonviolence in 2020 explores how an ethic of nonviolence must be connected to a broader political struggle for social equality, most important in our time. Her books have been translated in more than 27 languages. Judith has been active in several human rights organizations, including the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York and the Advisory Board of Jewish Voice for Peace. So Judith, the panel is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, David. Um, I'd like to second David's welcome to the discussion today on Saeed's Palestine with four scholars who have distinguished themselves by offering new frameworks for understanding Palestine in its history and its present forms. We are grateful to have their views on the topic of Edward Said and Palestine. Um, I want to thank David Theo Goldberg and his staff for organizing this event. And let me briefly remark on the title of today's event, Said's Palestine. In the last days, I've received some queries about how this is to be read. I could have asked David, um, but titles, once we give them, tend to be out of our hands. One reading of the title is the Palestine that belongs to Edward Said. While some part of Palestine should have belonged to him, surely, it doesn't make sense to imagine Palestine as his possession. A second might be to consider Palestine as an imaginary domain, the one that Said in some sense authored, but this would neglect the concrete historical realities, including the concrete struggles. A third approach is to consider what Said's writings have to say about Palestine, its history, present and future, and to query both the promise and the limits of his approach. This seems a bit closer to what we have in mind, but it seems important also to note all this because we might ask why Said now? To ask that question presumes maybe that he is out of date or that he needs to be updated and though he would have been the first to mark the historical limits of his own reflection, we might mark those limits differently in light of the present. The present, the brutal, murderous bombardment of Gaza, the continuation of the siege in Gaza, the intensification of militarized police powers on the borders of the West Bank, as well as the refinement of surveillance, torture, and incarceration within the West Bank. We add to this the still unacknowledged rights of return and reparation for all those dispossessed of land and home in 1948 and in the decades that have followed. So we turn to these two issues, Said and Palestine, in the wake of the last of many assaults on Palestinian lives, but also in the midst of a critical reception of Timothy Brennan's new work, Places of Mind, A Life of Edward Said, we are not obliged to address that work, but it does seem important to note the ways in which Said's substantial and enduring commitment to Palestinian injustice and freedom surely survives those who are more interested in generating skepticism. The criticism of Said's work has all been important. Laila Abulagad, Lisa Lowe on the place of gender in his analysis, Talal Assad, on his account of secularism, numerous scholars have commented as well as on how the north-south axis is missing from his account of orientalism and imperialism, or indeed his commitments to liberal humanism and the limits of that framework. And yet we do return to his work, or rather his work returns to us, not as the final word, no, but as a spur to think again about the larger structures animated in historical events and as a way to think critically and ethically about political justice. I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers. Nadia Abu El Hajj is professor in the departments of anthropology at Barnard College and Columbia University and co-director of the Center for Palestine Studies at Columbia 
She works at the intersection of scientific practices, including genetic research, social imaginaries, and political regimes. Her path-breaking books include Facts on the Ground, Archaeological Practice, and Territorial Self-Fashioning in Israeli Societies, as published, which was published in 2001, and then also The Genealogical Science, The Search for Jewish Origins, and The Politics of Epistemology, published in 2012. She, has at work, she is at work on, on a new book, um, tentatively entitled Soldier Trauma, The Obligations of Citizenship, and The Forever Wars, which will come out with Verso. She examines there the field of military psychiatry and explores the complex ethical and political implications of shifting psychiatric and public understandings of trauma, of the trauma of soldiers. Esmat al Halabi is an historian of the transnational Middle East and South Asia. He's currently a University of California President's postdoctoral fellow at the University of California at Davis. El Halabi will be joining the University of Toronto as an assistant professor soon, uh, once we all get to move about. Um, uh, his research focuses on the Arab intellectual links with South Asia in the 19th and 20th century, notably on the history of anti-colonialism, internationalism, and Islam. His current book manuscript in progress is entitled Parting Gifts of Empire, Palestine, India, and the Making of the Global South. It's an intellectual history of two colonial partitions and their aftermaths from the standpoint of their victims. Sari Makdisi is professor in the departments of English and Comparative Literature at UCLA. In addition to writing two remarkable books on William Blake, Makdisi is the author of Palestine Inside Out, An Everyday Occupation, 2008, Making England Western, Occidentalism, Race, and Imperial Culture, 2014. His important articles uh, in Critical in Inquiry, on the Museum of Tolerance in Jerusalem and the cultural destruction of Palestine uh, have appeared in a wide number of uh, publications. He has written extensively on the afterlives of colonialism in the contemporary Arab world and has contributed enormously important articles, examples of public thinking to a number of newspapers and magazines. He's presently working on two new books, London's Modernities and Palestine and the Psychogeography of Denial. Nadra Shalhoub Kevorkian is the Lawrence D. Beale Chair in Law at the Faculty of Law Institute of Criminology and the School of Social Work and Public Welfare at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and the Global Chair in Law at Queen Mary University of London. Shalhoub Kevorkian is the author of numerous books, among them Militarization and Violence Against Women in Conflict Zones in the Middle East, The Palestinian Case Study, 2010, Security, Theology, Surveillance, and the Politics of Fear, 2015, and Incarcerated Childhood and the Politics of Unchilding, published in 2019. As a resident of the old city of Jerusalem, Nadra is a prominent local activist opposing militarization and land dispossession. Along with Laila Abulagod, Rima Hamami, and Janet Jacobson, she recently completed a Loose Foundation grant on the topic religion and the global framing of gender violence. I'd like to um, open the floor to our interlocutors, and I will start with um, uh, Nadia. Uh, Abu El Haj. Um, we each have about five to seven minutes to speak, and then we'll have conversation and open up to some questions toward the end. Nadia. Sorry, I had to unmute there. Um, thank you so much. I want to thank uh, David Theo Goldberg and uh, for inviting me to do this. Of course, the staff behind the scenes for organizing this, and all of my co-panelists, as well as Judith uh, Butler. Um, moderator here. Um, so, so as not to waste time, I'm just going to start. I, in preparing initial comments, I decided to go to an essay that I've thought a lot about in the last couple of years, um, Edward Said's essay, Permission to Narrate. 
um, and sort of uh, bounce off of that. So published in the mid 80s, Permission to Narrate responded most immediately to the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon and the ways in which Israel's narrative about self-defense and a purity of arms, among other well-worn ideological tropes, survived that war to retain a strong hold over, in particular, the Amer American public conversations and foreign policy. Facts do not stand on their own, he argued. They require narratives, and narratives must be socially acceptable. They must be authorized in order to be heard. The Palestinian narrative, as he refers to it, has not gained the permission to be heard, not yet. The essay and its diagnosis of the struggle to re restore what he called the Palestinian communal narrative as a historical story, unquote, still resonates today. The Palestinian remains the terrorist, now cast most centrally in the figure of Hamas. Israel still acts in self-defense. The IDF is a force that aspires to a purity of arms, even if it cannot always realize that purity given the tactics of its enemy. And as Palestinians and their supporters assert the other historical narrative here, that is, as they narrate the Nakba as ongoing, they are charged with anti-Semitism, an accusation that seems to be on steroids today. Nevertheless, it's also true that much has changed over the past 40 years. There is far more space, space for the Palestinian narrative, perhaps better named a counter narrative. It was on display in the US over the past several weeks. Representatives stood up on the House floor to condemn Israeli policies. They framed the Palestinian plight within the terms of a racial reckoning, however divisive it is in the US today. Activists and unions came out in support of Palestinians and even the New York Times published the photographs and names of every child killed in the latest war on Gaza. 66 Palestinians, two Israelis. The BLM chant, say her name, echoes through this publishing choice. Political progress perhaps is evident here. Nevertheless, I wonder, what if the epistemological and political ground has shifted beneath our feet such that this emerging permission to narrate may not be as consequential as we might wish to believe it could become? Let me quote the closing words of Saeed's essay, quote, each of these two communities, that is Israelis and Palestinians, is interested in its origins, this history of suffering, its need to survive, to recognize these imperatives as components of national identity, and to try and reconcile them strikes me as the task at hand, unquote. But I once wondered, are those two national narratives constitutively irreconcilable? What if they're incommensurable? I'm no longer convinced the narratives are mutually unintelligible, that recognizing one necessarily requires denying the reality of the other. But that change in my thinking is not born of any optimism about the possibility of reconciliation. It's born rather of a sense, a dread perhaps, I have of a far more pernicious configuration of epistemology, of knowing and authorizing, and politics today. What if the Palestinian narrative, or at least foundational elements of it, can be, quote, officially admitted to Israeli history, unquote, that's from the essay, and yet made irrelevant at the same time. For decades following the War of 48, the Israeli narrative denied the Nakba's existence. The land was empty. There's no such thing as a Palestinian. Arab regimes misled the Arab inhabitants of Palestine, telling them to flee Zionist forces who meant them no harm. By the late 1970s, that Israeli narrative had begun to fray. Israeli historians read their own history, read their own now declassified state archives, and they documented, at least in broad strokes, what Palestinians refer to as the Nakba. That is the narrative that the majority of Palestinians were expelled by Zionist militias during the War of 48 was accepted. Some even accepted that the expulsion was intentional and pre-planned. By the turn of the new millenniums, the basic of that new for Israelis, that is new and many in the West, of that new historical narrative were pretty widely accepted in the Israeli academy and in Israeli society writ large, but with what political consequences? Let's take a turn to Sheikh Sharrah a few weeks ago. Jewish settlers are rampaging through the neighborhood chanting death to the Arabs and Arab, an Israeli TV reporter stops on one man to speak with him. The guy says, this is what happened in 1948. We are just doing what needs to be done, and this is a loose translation, to establish Zew Jewish sovereignty over Jerusalem, unquote. The Israeli state has moved dramatically to the right into fascist territory since Said's death. 
Transfer, once discussed only on the far, range, far right fringes of the political spectrum, is more acceptable or at least debatable and discussable today. And yet Israeli society is certainly less in denial about the Palestinian Nekba, in particular the Nekba, I mean, sorry, the narrative, in particular the Nekba than it once was. I wanna suggest that perhaps today, the more committee, committed one is to the Zionist project, the more likely one might be to embrace the Nakba. Palestinians were expelled in 48 and they might need to be expelled again. This, zero, this is a zero sum game that will be won at any cost or so the ideology goes. And lest it seem the political right is the only problem here, accepting the Nakba and at the same time insisting that it had to be crosses the political spectrum. To name but one instance, in 2013, Ari Shavit, a prominent journalist for, ha for Haaretz, confronted the Nakba through an account of Lidda, a city in central Palestine. The account tells the story of what happened there during the 1948 war. For, following his historical account that included a massacre and the expulsion of its population, of its Palestinian population, he writes, quote, the choice is stark, either reject Zionism because of Lidda or accept Zionism along with Lidda. Shavit then declares that he chooses to stand by the damned. My point is this, perhaps the Palestinian Nakba and the brute and enduring violence of colonial, violence of colonial power can happily coexist. The Nakba as historical narrative is widely known, talked about even, but it has not emerged as a matter of urgent public concern and action. It compels no recognition of a need for justice reparation or repair. Israeli settlerhood may no longer require the suppression or denial of 1948, that is of the fundamental ground of the Palestinian narrative. Instead, it operates through the embrace increasingly of a far more brazen and explicit, explicit seizure of power and knowledge, perhaps of even the Palestinian narrative itself. Yes, the Nakba, and no, we Israelis don't care. How then does one respond to that? Thank you. Quite a question. Thank you, Nadia. Um, we'll turn now to uh, es Esmat El Khalabi. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a great honor uh, and privilege to be uh, among you all. And uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. If you'll permit me, I'll, I'll read for about six and a half minutes. In 1994, Iqbal Ahmad addressed a conference in Gaza. He was there in Edward Said's place, who arranged for Ahmad to attend, for he couldn't make it, as he was undergoing chemotherapy. Ahmad, like Said and so many other Asian and African intellectuals of their generation and political temperament, embraced the world and were embraced by the world. The scene of their thought and the arena of their action was by necessity greater than their homelands. In considering Said's Palestine, as we've been asked to do today, it is necessary, I think, to stray somewhat from Said in order to see the Palestine he himself knew. A Palestine often buried in negative representations as a place of indecipherable complexity and Muslim fanaticism that has meant a great deal to a great many people around the world as a site of continuous struggle and resistance against colonialism and its imperial patrons. In Gaza, Ahmed introduced himself in a fraternal idiom, quote, in the marvelously universal terms in which Arab patriots defined Arabism, I should be counted as an Arab. In this age of sectarian and exclusionary nationalism, this was an open invitation I could not resist. I am an Arab and entitled to making harsh judgments on the man-made disasters that pile on us. In his speech, Ahmed reflected on his experience of decolonization in South Asia in the summer of 1947, when as he wrote, India and Pakistan waded in blood to independence. He continued, at the dawn of decolonization, Palestine was colonized. I recall my utter confusion at this irony of history. A few years before, Amid what, was, what is called the first intifada, Siam Naim, the great scholar of Urdu letters, who like Ahmed was born in the 1930s in the north of British India, also visited Gaza. Naim's account of his 1989 trip 
is rich and detailed, at once critical, sympathetic, and learned. Throughout the piece, Naeem drew comparisons between India and Palestine. People asked me where I was originally from, Naeem wrote. And when I told them, they responded with unusual warmth. India is seen as a staunch friend of the Palestinians. I don't speak Arabic, but having been raised a Muslim, I know a few verses from the Quran and the traditional formulaic responses on occasions of grief and loss. As I uttered them, I felt a bond being formed, superficial perhaps, yet very real in that moment. In Gaza, Naim met with the great feminist and pedagogue Yusra al-Barbari, one of the most remarkable persons I have ever met, he said. Born in Gaza in 1923, al-Barbari, who died in 2009, also in Gaza, was an important teacher and later te trainer of teachers. She was also involved deeply in the organization of women in Gaza and across Palestine, as well as with women athletes. She would, like many Palestinians, carry the Palestinian cause around the world in delegations, at conferences, tournaments, and meetings. A global project that was severely curtailed, however, when in 1974, she was forbidden from exiting the Gaza Strip by the Israelis. Given her passion and energy, Naim remarked, quote, it was no wonder she was not allowed to stir out of Gaza. In his 1986 book, After the Last Sky, Said recounted the massive corpus of Palestinian biography, autobiography, memoir, and self-statement which stands in opposition to Zionist erasure. Said himself was, of course, an important contributor to that literature. Through his many books, essays, and interviews, he was, no doubt, one of the most eloquent narrators of Palestinian life and proponents of the Palestinian cause in any language. In his rehearsal of Palestinian narrative, however, he also acknowledged its limits. Quote, I recognize in all this a fundamental problem, the crucial absence of women. Without narrating their statements, Said concluded, we will never fully understand our experience of dispossession. Today, women's utterances are better accounted for. No observer of the events in Palestine in the last month or so could ignore the eloquent testimony and the powerful ideas written and spoken by Palestinian and Arab women. Where would we be without Mona al kurds fiery taunts or the organizational acumen of the Palestinian Feminist Collective. While third world women have long been aligned with Palestine, it is no small feat that a few weeks ago, centers and departments of women's and gender studies across the country and the world signed a statement in support of Palestinian liberation. Of course, it was the organized women's movement in the colonized world which first insisted that the Palestinian cause be a global one. When Huda Sha'arawi resolved to organize a women's conference in defense of Palestine, in 1938, the formidable Palestinian nationalist Akram Zaitar urged her to call it an Arab women's conference. Sha'arawi, however, insisted that the horizon of their efforts be wider and that the meeting be referred to as an Eastern women's conference, and it was. In one essay, wherein he drew on Michelle Rolf Trio's Silencing the Past to reflect on the massacre of Palestinians in the village of Deir Yassin, Said lamented the Palestinian condition. I quote at length. Our history is written by outsiders, and we have conceded the battle in advance, and we continue to concede and concede more and concede again, not only in the present, but also in the past and in the future. Collective memory is a people's heritage, but also its energy it does not merely sit there inertly, but it must be activated as part of the people's identity and sense of its own prerogative. To recall Deir Yassin is not just to dwell on past disasters, but to understand who we are and where we are going. Without it, we are simply lost, as, it, as indeed it seems we really are." Unquote. Said wrote these words in 1997, in the midst of Oslo's delusions. Today, as Palestinians shake the world with their movement, I don't think we're lost anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Esmat. Look forward to discussing this when the conversation opens up. Um, uh, Sari Makdisi, you're, you're next. Um, I want to also, first of all, acknowledge uh, my gratitude to David and the staff of UCHRI for organizing this and Judith for moderating and my, my amazing co-panelists for being here with me because uh, this means a lot to all of us, obviously. Um, 
And I also want to say following Nadia and Asma is more difficult, even more difficult than I thought it was going to be. So I guess, uh, I mean, Nadia, you're going to have, it's all going down to you. So I guess you're, you know, good luck. <laughs> um, no, I think, I mean, there, there's, uh, when we're talking about Said and Palestine, I mean, as, 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 Nadir, as Nadia said, as Judith said, as Asmat has said, there's so many different ways of thinking about it. So many different lines in his text, so many different text, books, essays, et cetera, that one could turn to. The temptations are endless. There, I mean, I, was, I went through about 20 different possibilities. The one I kept coming back to is a line, I think it's in the question of Palestine, it could be somewhere else. And maybe it's one of those lines that he repeated in other places too. But the, the line that I had in mind is, uh, it may not, be, may not even be a line, it may just be a, a, like a phrase that he, he used. He talks about the idea of Palestine. And that, 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 that idea of an idea, the, that idea of Palestine being not just a place, although also it's a place, not just a country, although it's sort of a country. I mean, it's certainly, a, it's a national place uh it's not it's not yet independent obviously it's not it's very much under embargo and bombardment and siege and apartheid and so on um but there's something there's something more to palestine than just that and that's what edward uh that's what edward talked about a lot and i think it meant a lot to him uh to, to think about the the kind of the stretch the, the the breadth the reach of palestine as an idea that goes beyond merely uh, the, the the physical place that one can one can go to or not, uh, that one can visit or not, that one that one wants to go to one the site of return, for example, the site of desire uh, that many of us uh, feel. Um, but that idea of Palestine uh, is something that that um, that we can see at work in the world all around us in so many in so many different kinds of ways, and. Um, if one thinks about just, just just to think about the most recent, you know, whatever two or three weeks, whatever it's been recently, and I've talked about this in other occasions, in other in other in other venues, the the idea that um, people spontaneously around the world uh, were protesting on behalf of Palestine, were marching for Palestine, uh, even I mean, you know, places like I mean, here in LA there was a huge protest, London, Paris, where it's not allowed, Berlin, where it's also not allowed. All over the Arab world, of course, in Jordan and Lebanon, Baghdad, perhaps most remarkably in Yemen, where you think that people have enough problems on their hands to begin with, they're still protesting uh, for Palestine. In Santiago, throughout Latin America, in South Africa, in, in other places in Europe, the, 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 the breadth of global feeling for Palestine speaks to the idea of Palestine. In other words, it speaks not just to this to the the small country on the eastern edge of the Mediterranean. It speaks to the way in which Palestine means something that goes beyond the the, the place. It speaks to the idea of Palestine as uh, a struggle for justice. It speaks for defiance and steadfastness in the face of injustice and racism and hostility and occupation and and all the things that go with that. Right? It speaks to it speaks to the vitality of the idea of Palestine, um, and I think the other thing that it speaks to is the sense of uh, power that that Palestinians have that we've often overlooked. Um, so I mean, we're all familiar, especially in the U.S. Academy these days. I mean, not, not, I know that not all of us are right now in the U.S. Academy, um, but there's an awareness in the U.S. Academy of the extent to which. Uh, Palestine has been embargoed over the years in various kinds of ways. Speaking out has been made difficult or impossible and careers have been lost. And, and, and all of those things, of course, are, are very real. There's a, there's a certain degree of censorship and, and suppression of, of the expression of Palestinian thought um, that's beginning to loosen up now. And that's still now being met with new forms of counter reaction. What's interesting is that if you think about all those forms of suppression of the idea of Palestine as an, as, as a, as expressions of a form of power, in this case, the power of the Israeli state or of its aiders and abettors in the US and Europe and, and other kinds of places. And of course it does speak to a certain kind of power. There is also, on the other hand, a, you know, very much there, very much, we can see it all over the place as well, a kind of Palestinian counter power, which goes back to this idea of Palestine. And here I wanna reflect on not just demonstrations and marches and protests, that occur, you know, that have occurred, that were occurring and have been occurring recently in support of 
Palestine and Palestinians uh, in, in Palestine. Um, but also um, things like, you know, the, the fact that at, at demonstrations that had nothing to do with Palestine all over the world for at least 15 or 20 years, it's, it is common practice. For example, demonstrations in support of environmental justice or BLM or all kinds of things that don't on the face of it have anything directly to do with the question of Palestine. You'll see Palestinian flags. Right? And you, the reason why you see the Palestinian flag is that the Palestinian flag speaks to this greater idea of Palestine that Said was talking about. It's an idea that's not just that little country, but something bigger than the little country. This idea of, of a struggle for justice and, and defiance and steadfastness in the face of injustice. And that idea is, is, um, is, is it's, a, it's connected to power. I mean, in other words, Palestinians can, can have often not used it sufficiently. I think they've not tapped into it enough. And they are just now in the past two years beginning to realize the extent to which this idea of Palestine, as, as Said referred to it, endows them with a certain kind of power in the face of uh, this, this in, in the struggle with, with, uh, with, uh, with Zionism, right? With, with an incredibly power, also powerful, but in a different way, powerful state, right? So the Israeli form of power is of course, you know, airplanes that can blow up buildings from a million miles away and tanks and you know, soldiers and that sort of thing. Palestine doesn't have that kind of, Palestinians don't have that kind of power. Palestinians have a different kind of power. And that's, it's this idea of power, which I think is, 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 is uh, we, which we can see at work all of, in the world all around us, but also has a kind of an edge to it, a kind of efficacy to it that can be brought to bear in this contestation between Palestinians and Zionism. And so the last thing I wanna say, and again, I'm looking forward to our collective conversation around this, is, is this idea of, of the idea of Palestine. Um, we can see it, you know, when people refer to Israel-Palestine, which they, which they often do, and they, they do it sort of casually sometimes. Um, Israel and Palestine are, you, know, you could say like Israel is, is a state with a state apparatus and you know, ministries and an army and all the rest of it. Um, Palestine isn't a state, it's, an, it's this idea, but Israel is also an idea of a certain kind. Right? It's, a, it's an idea, at least from a Palestinian perspective, it's an idea of, from a Palestinian perspective, certainly hostility and occupation and apartheid and injustice. So what I want to think about is when we hear this expression, Israel-Palestine, we need to think about a contestation between two ideas, ultimately, that's what it comes down to. Two ideas connected to all sorts of material circumstances, but the two ideas effectively are, uh, hinge around a, de a defense of injustice as opposed to resistance and a, and, a, and a cause for justice. I mean, that's what it comes down to, I think. Not to think in binary terms, but it, it's that, that sort of struggle around the, the question of justice is what we're seeing uh, unfold before our eyes. And what that lets us think about is the kind of where we are now. It goes back to what David is saying at the very beginning of our conversation today, the talk of uh, solutions to this to this 70 year nightmare. And to the, it, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, uh, in, basically inevitability of a one state solution, which is essentially basically what we have now. And then the question of how does one define that one state? And we come back to this, these two ideas about how to understand the one state, the one state that exists now is the state of Israel with all that it represents. And the alternative idea is the idea of Palestine, which involves for, for more and more Palestinians, I think, and even some Israelis at this point too, and people clearly around the world as well, uh, a single state with, uh, with based, uh, based on, on secular politics and on uh, justice and equality for all. And that idea of Palestine is, is incredibly powerful and um, I think it's that that's the direction that the Palestinian struggle will be taking in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I, I see I see a very interesting discussion forming. Um, Nadara, would you like to to go next? Yes. Uh, yeah. It's really a great honor to be with you. And thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Judith, for accepting to moderate it. Uh, let me start my way. Learning about the killing of Raja Abul Auf with her four children, a mental health worker and a friend in Gaza, hit me really bad. The criminalities against Gaza paralyzed me. And my usual remedy 
is to walk the streets of the old city here in Jerusalem, speak with friends, shop owners, and produce sellers to insist on our livability, togetherness, and maybe open path of hope amidst such loss and wounding. But my walk in Babisbat was faced with a group of Israeli mobs singing and dancing on our graveyards in Bab Rahmi graveyard. So how can I engage with Saeed's intellectual and political engagement with the present condition in Palestine? The political moment and Saeed's passionate attachment to the question of Palestine, his analysis of the nature of power, the Palestine's and anti-colonial struggle insist on an urgency to rethink the current global politics, the time, the space, the fundamental vocabularies of what constitute a state, the violence, resistance, activism, and decolonization, as well as what it means to refuse the terms, the politics, the structures, the laws given to us. I engage with Saeed to talk about refusal, our refusal to accept how and what is knowable and being known about us, our refusal to be narrated, but rather to narrate ourselves. I do this to invite you to help us form an epistemic and political disobedience to what is known about our struggle in Palestine. So I'll draw three points of Said's work. One is Zionism and the state. So in his book, The Question of Palestine, I quote, he says, it was the word that made the success of Zionism possible. And it was Zionism's sense of the world as supporter and audience that played a considerable practical role in the struggle of, for Palestine. He continues to criticize Zionism now then is to criticize not so much an idea or a theory, but rather a wall of denials, end of quote. That wall of denial facilitated indifference, where people did not listen, and a global complacency to crude as another atrocity. This wall of denial, however, is currently crumbling, I hope. I'm speaking to you from the old city of Jerusalem, where daily military occupation, apartheid, dispossession, and killability faces off with Palestinians' livability, togetherness, joy, love, and growing solidarity here and around the world. I want to engage with this new moment that has arisen as refusal of the wall of denials enacted through the viciousness of killing and caging Palestinians in Gaza through the militarization and Judaization of Jerusalem in the old city, Sheikh Jarrah Silwan Wadi Yasul, where ethnic cleansing is going ongoing to Judaize. So Zionism through the state and its multiple mobs had continued to create new strategies for land and life grabbing to penetrate our homes and penetrate our homeland. It invades our everydayness on the way to school for kids, during birth for women, during funerals, through home evictions and demolitions to ethnically cleanse. The Judaized spaces occupy our senses, as I say in my work, arrest our beloved ones and terrorize our communities. So we are at a moment of intense possibilities and intense danger. The global community is breaking the wall of denials as it reacts to Israel's Palestinian cleansing and elimination, shattering the myth of Israel being the only democracy in the Middle East. In Said's work, neither in Orientalism nor in his numerous sequent writing did Said's conception of power diverge from its focus on the state and its hegemony. Instead, he insisted that the central reality of power and authority in Western history, at least since the period of the end of feudalism, rests within the state. After all, it was the state that allowed certain entities to have sacred rights in here and used the language of the right for self-defense while engaging 73 years of uprooting Judaization and destruction. Said insisted that we look at the state and its authority legitimacy, that we engage with the question of responsibility and that the ethics and politics of silence and silencing are part of our analytical tool. Number two, Said's book, Out of Place. I'm speaking again from the old city of Jerusalem and yet in the old city of Jerusalem, yet I'm out of place while being in our place in our homeland. We are exilic subjects, exilic at home, 
It's almost like a waiting game with the Zionists waiting for us to die or leave Palestine. Being in exile at home, not really out of place, reveals also the unending refusal of Palestinians to accept our uprooting as the only mode of maintaining the settler state. When Palestinians refuse and resist, Israel always kills Palestinian civilians, as you've just seen. The state's viciousness now includes starting amount of arrests in the last month in historic Palestine, but it includes threats to revoke residency here in, the, in occupied East Jerusalem, revoke medical insurance, social security. The viciousness also leads to loss of jobs, loss of income, and attacks on Palestinian livability because Palestinians resist. Watching the attacks on children alone as my work on Unchiding clearly reveals, we see that our children became a political capital in the hands of the state to further unchild them, arrest them, and, and kill the, and govern their hopes. So Zionist policy to stage Palestinians as present absentees continues in multiple forms. Present as terrorists, dangerous others, absent as humans with rights. So the world needs to recognize that the Nakba and the previous and current destructions of Gaza, ethnic and racial erasure in Jerusalem in the Naqab bil Araqib, Yafa will lead, coupled with states legalized dispossession, for example, the nation state law that enshrined the supremacy of Jewish Israeli are all part of the grand settler colonial Zionist plan to erase Palestinians from their homeland and refusal and resistance challenges states' necropolitics. Number three, Said's argument in the permission to narrate, and I won't repeat what Nadia have said, but one can narrate amidst Zionist common sense. And how can we narrate amidst Zionist common sense in the midst of killing, uprooting, and dispossession? How can we narrate against the racial making of the terrorist other, born criminal and outsider? How can we narrate amidst the whiteness of global Zionism and its increased securitization of the state, the rushing through the anti-terror legislation, the development of disciplining mechanism, and, and not only of those living, as I say, but also of those maimed and dead. The current moment of smooth, a moment that used the vehicle of social media where Palestinians and non-Palestinians broke the wall of denials by taking to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, showed the global community state brutality. Not surprisingly, the Israeli government tried to shut them down. Let me conclude. So what is the problem here when I read Said and I look at our situation? The problem that we exist is the problem that our past and present, our memory and uprooting, gloss, smooth, steadfastness, our use to narrate, visualize, write, and be heard, reproduce our existence or no existence? Is our existence a provocation to the settler state and its allies and those who are building more walls of denial? I am worried as our existence as terrorist others might require a solution from the state and its mobs. The mobs that are chanting, Gaza is a graveyard, death to the Arabs and we shall burn your villages. I'm worried about exterminatory solution. So from here, from the old city of Jerusalem, I see the mobs from the window around me and they are here dancing on our graveyards. And I think this is a time to really think and wonder why our existence is a major problem for this Zionist entity. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Nad Nadera. I really appreciate it. I'm sure we all do. Um, let me just ask one question and then I'm going to turn to the questions that have been uh, generated by um, the uh, sizable audience <laughs> that has come to, to hear uh, all of you today. Um, obviously, there's a difference of opinion about how the permission to narrate can work and whether it can still work. And uh, Nadia gave, gave us um, something to think about here is it is it not possible that we could establish all the historical facts of the Nakba and we can 
we have the archives and we've pub we've publicized them and that history is now known and indeed confirmed more broadly and still um, there is no shame there's no call for justice there's no responsibility um, uh, exercised on behalf of the Israeli state in fact uh, if anything the Nakba is affirmed and it is called for again and if we say oh what you are doing is a continuation of that Nakba they may well just say yes and it will get worse uh, because expulsion and destruction is the aim. And so one question is whether uh, instead of um, trying to advertise themselves as the only moral or democratic um, state in the region, which was never true, they now have shifted to a form of self-defense that licenses uh, in, in infinite killing. Uh, there is no end to that killing because there is no end to the legitimacy of their idea of self-defense. So I'd like to hear you all maybe reflect on um, whether the permission to narrate is still possible and mobilizing as much suggested that it is happening and it's happening in new ways. And as we retell that history, we can see the importance of women's mobilization and that this continues to be the case. And Sari tells us that not sure if it's a narrative structure, maybe Palestine as an ideal is what has uh, articulated several um, uh, social movements together as they seek freedom and justice um, uh, and equality, that, that Palestine becomes a kind of overarching signifier, uh, which brings vitality and solidarity to a wide range of movements. and and um, and Madara has told us that we are we're seeing other movements join, that there's a shift in public opinion as this moment of history is being narrated anew, that at some point uh, a general consensus or a consensus on the part of something called the global community, not sure how to think that, um, uh, has, has promise. So maybe we, we start with, with Nadia, who is, I, I think, arguably the most pessimistic, skeptical, um, maybe you could um, you could uh, say something, and then we'll see if others want to join in. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm. Yeah, yeah, I may be the most pessimistic. I actually don't want to. I, I mean, I agree with what Sadie is saying, and I agree like with with everything that everybody else said. That I think we have these two tensions happening at the same. time, These two things happening at the same time. The Palestinian movement has become much more powerful. The, the narrative, I'm not sure it's the narrative, but a narrative has become both more acceptable, you know, I think the real pivot is the Euro-American world because most of the globe all we saw is real for what it was, um, and is being picked up as standing in certain movements and communities as standing as a sign that's beyond itself as well as this, this struggle against injustice. I believe that, I think there has been a shift um, I mean, I moved to the States in the sort of around the 82, after the 82 invasion of Lebanon, there was no space. I mean, it might've been better than the sixties, I have no idea, but there was really no space for a counter narrative. But I think what that struggle is up against may be a very different configuration of the Israeli state. I mean, to begin with, we have these fascist and proto-fascist movements globally. The Israeli state in many ways could be argued to be one of the states at the forefront of it. And the kind of seizure of power no longer, or I don't mean this as, it's not a clean break, but there are certainly ways in which it's seizure of power um, no longer requires a kind of liberal self-fashioning. It's brutal, it's honest. There are elements who couldn't care less. There are elements that are like, well, self-defense. And then there are even liberals who, like Shavit, you know, the basically the book is a moral self-reckoning, which is if I say I'm pained by this, I'm a liberal subject, but it doesn't really require I do anything differently about the Nakba, right? So I think there are these two things pulling in very different directions. And I guess my worry, which may be why I come off sounding, and I think it's all rooted in what um, Joan Scott recently wrote in her book about the judgment of history, that we sort of believe that in the end, justice will win out. Well, I don't know. And I kind of want us to keep our eyes on that ball because I think there is in some sense more of a focus, at least in the US among activists and many scholars on the optimism than the dangers. 
And to go back to Nadra, what you were saying, I, I mean, I also think what's happened with in the last several weeks around these so-called mixed cities inside 48, uh, right? The 48 borders and the fact that they are referred to as mixed cities, we should take very seriously, right? In the US, one would cringe at the idea of referring to a city as a mixed city, which doesn't mean the US isn't a racist place, but what's happened there makes it harder and harder, I think, for Israeli Jews to say, oh yeah, coexistence is fine, the Palestinians inside the Green Line are perfectly happy. And I think that makes the risk of a kind of very brutal transfer idea it possibly begins to mainstream that even more. So it's more that I see we're being pulled in these radically two different directions. And I don't think we should assume that even if that narrative is accepted, anybody that it's going to matter in the sense of, I don't care, this is what it takes, we'll do it again, right? I hope that wasn't too long. Not at all. Um, Asma, did you wanna offer something here? Um. One thing that I think is important to remember, and I, I, I you know, I, everyone's comments, I, I, again, I agree with as well. I think there's room for a lot of positions to be taken. I think the important thing to remember is that the last people who are going to be convinced that Palestinian freedom and freedom for Palestinians to live and move around Palestine are going to be the Zionist settlers. I mean, in every case, uh, in, in every instance of colonial history, that is the case, right? So the world will be with us before the people who have the most to lose, obviously, uh, get with the program. So I think there's no doubt that it's more right wing than it's ever been. Um, and some of the liberal shelf fashioning, which I think was always a minority position, uh, in any case, uh, is not there. I think it's inevitable that the work of Palestinians, which is all over and which has a lot more to do with thinking about the future and imagining what Palestine is going to be and what we can draw from, from the past, not simply to justify our existence in that past, but rather to think about, all right, well, we, we certainly have a huge archive of people who know how to live free in Palestine or thought about living free in Palestine for a long time. How do we then use that to make our case for the future of a free Palestine? And I think that, that kind of narrative work and that idea of Palestine is essential. We'll always have time to write history. And when Palestine is free, it'll be easier to write that history and we'll have more archives and so on. That's for sure like a project and it's a scholarly project and it's essential. Um, but that's only one part I think of doing uh, the kind of narrative work that is crucial for the liberation of Palestine. Um, and uh, Nadia, I think is totally right that the world's always been on our side and it's these countries the US principally, but also all across Europe that have enabled Israeli violence on a daily basis with arms, with guns, with justification in international forums uh, that are a major problem ideologically. And uh, that's certainly going to have to change. And I think that will change before the position of Israeli settlers will change. Thank you. Um... Sorry, I'd, I'd like to um, ask you to address this issue, but I, I'm also gonna uh, add a question from the audience that you might be able to work into your response. Um, uh, what about the Saidian contrapuntal model? Is this model more figural than representational and representative? Does it concede more than realize in the context of the one versus two nation option is the contrapuntal text one or two? What is the proportionality of recognition to antagonism within the Saidian counterpoint? I don't know if you can work with that, um, but I'll, I'll leave it to you to handle that. Uh, thanks, Judith. That's a great question. Uh, let me. I'll think about that sort of in the in the background. But I want to respond to what Nadira, Nadia, and Asma just said as well, which which is super important, and what they said, you know, in the first round as well. I mean, what Nadia is talking about and what Nadia sees literally looking outside her window is 
a, a shift in the Israeli state and in Zionism in Israel itself, which is, I mean, as, as, they're, as they're both said very rightly, it very rightly, it's a shift to the right. It's a market, you know, an, an evident shift to the right that that has absolutely no shame and is not invested at all in a rhetoric of denial and covering up and obfuscation. No, it's death to the Arabs and let's, let's you know, bomb Gaza into the Stone Age. And it's, it's this kind of explicit, uh, explicit sort of uh, uh, necrophilia kind of is what it comes down to is this dancing on graves and so forth as Nadira, you know, very powerfully and she's not exaggerating. It's quite, what she's talking about is quite literal as well. Um, Israel's Independence Park is literally built on a Muslim cemetery in Jerusalem. And there's no, no exaggeration, no, no finesse, no, that's, that is what it is. Um, Nadia's right, I mean, in the sense that there's a, there's a hardening of, of what these, of, of the Israeli sort of modus operandi. There's, there's, the, they're kind of, uh, uh, they're, they are investing very, very heavily in what they see as a world of that's a world that in their imagination of it has shifted to the right irrevocably and is now gonna be dominated by authoritarian you know, dictators and, and, and surveillance and drones and bombing and all the rest of it. Not that the world isn't necessarily going that way, it might be going that way. However, um, I personally, I, I've just finished writing a, a whole book about this, so I have a great deal invested in this argument that what sustained Israel and Zionism for the past six or seven decades, at least, if not longer, is a, is a massive apparatus of denial and obfuscation and equivocation. That's what made it possible to, 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 to secure legitimacy in the US above all, also in Europe. That's what sustained it. That's what financed it. That's what drove it. That's what nourished it. That's what kept it going for decades and decades and decades and decades. The denial that the ending's happening the denial of ethnic cleansing, the denial, which they still do to this day, of apartheid, and the denial of all these terrible things and, and so on, right? So because people, I think, by and large, yes, of course, there are people in the West who subscribe to the ideology of surveillance and drone bombing and killing and mass murder and extermination. Of course, the West has its elements like that, too. But by and large, I don't think most people in the world, even in the Western world, subscribe to that kind of view, that outlook. And so what the Israelis are doing by passing the 2018 nation state law that Nadia refer referred to, by, by hardening their forms of discourse like Nadia was reminding us of, they're kind of chucking out the denial thing and they're just saying, yeah, we want to exterminate, yeah, exterminate the brutes, ba basically. It's like out of Conrad, right? Um, and, and what that's going to do is it's basically going to make it much, much, much more difficult in the years to come for them to continue to nourish uh, the kinds of support that they need to sustain their enterprise here in the U.S. and in, in Western Europe, it's going to be it's going to make their life it's going to make their project much more difficult. If I have to choose, of course, I'm sitting comfortably on the outside, mind you, not like now that are where this is literally down across the road from me. But if I have to choose between an Israeli prime minister who's going to talk the talk of peace and negotiations in one state and three states and six states and talk and talk and talk, but in fact on the ground go on with the project of apartheid and building and colonization and demolition and you know murder and all the rest of it, as opposed to an Israeli politician who just bluntly says, yes, we want to exterminate the brutes. I'd much rather have, because at the end of the day on the ground, they're basically the same. I'd much rather have the blunt one than the one who's all you know, wrapped up in cloaks of denial and disguise and obfuscation and mystification because the, the blunt one is a lot easier to argue with because you could just tell the world, look, they are, it's not that you have to kind of peel off the layers. They're throwing off the layers of denial. As far as I'm concerned, let them throw them off because on the ground, it comes to the same. They've always, it's not like it's suddenly now an apartheid state. It's always been an apartheid state from, 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 day, from before day one even. It's always been a colonial state. It's always been a racial state. These are not, none of this stuff is new. It's just that it's the cloak is coming off, and the you know the, the the language is as Nadia powerfully pointed out. It's coming out into the open. My, I'm I you know if you go back and, and look at what I was talking about in terms of the support for Palestine around the entire world, there is there is there is un, uh, bottomless support for Palestine because it stands for all of the opposite of those things. That is the source of support for Palestine around around the world, and. I, I, you know, I can see what, I mean, I see, if, of course, I agree with what Nadira and Nadia are both saying. And I think they're right. They're talking about this, the Israeli state and its apparatus on the ground there. I don't think that their representation here will, will be so successful. And one last thing I'll just say in parting, which is uh, 
um, if you look at the extent to which Zionism in the US today depends absolutely on, it's heavily invested in modes of suppression and denial, right? Be, like the whole debate that, we're, that we keep having about anti-Semitism which is meant to kind of cover up what's happening, say, no, let's talk about this thing rather than that thing, or don't look there, look here, that, all, all those sorts of things. Or the movement against BDS or the movement against one state, all those, the laws against BDS, for example, that are passed in practically every US state and they want our college campuses to pass it too. And they want, they want to you know, label criticism of Zionism to be anti-Semitism and so on and so forth. That all speaks to a fear on their part. They are terrified, I think in the US and in, in, in American and European context, they are terrified of a debate being waged on open terms like the ones that Nadira and Nadia are both, are both drawing our attention to. I think, and I think that's significant. What, what Esmat was talking about is, and what I'm, what I'm talking about too, is, is a sense of support globally and of course, maybe you know I could well be wrong, and I, maybe the world is a lot darker than I than I than I imagine it to be. But I'd like to think that the Israelis are, are making a terrible miscalculation here in in throwing their lot in with vengeance and death and destruction and and you know exterminate the brutes and the kind of you know the Kurds of, of heart of darkness, basically, which is how they're speaking these days. But I'd rather have them speak that way than to do the kind of the other stuff, which which just you know the Rabin and Perez. Let's all make peace and this kind of thing. I'm just quickly on the question. Of, I can't possibly do the, do the question of counterpoint justice, Judith, but just briefly, I would say that, I mean, Said's conception of counterpoint has to do with relation. So you could think about, you know, how could a, how could a one state be about relation, you know, about this sort of relationship back and forth, but also counterpoint, remember, also is about major and minor after all, right? And so I think it doesn't, I don't think the, the political efficacy is is there, uh, is, is as, as, as available for us in political terms as it is in literary or cultural terms. I hope that makes sense. That, that does, thank you, sorry. Um, Nadra, there's a, a lot that, um, that people are asking of you. And um, of course, there's also an important question here from the audience, uh, from someone who works for um, the Palestine Mental Health Network um, uh, in, in Ireland. And um, they want to know about the reality of, of trauma that, um, that is being conveyed in international media, especially with regard to children and the consideration of the intergenerational impact of trauma, if you could speak to that. Um, and I guess another, another question, which is, I think, maybe a question for all of you is, you know, how, how many more Palestinians have to die? Uh, before this point is driven home about the radical injustice of the Israeli state, its, its brutal violence, its, um, its genocidal policies. Um, so do, d does this require more death to make this point? And, um, and if so, how, how, how much more really do we think is required? I mean, it's an ironic kind of terrible uh, question but it's a, it's a, it's a real one. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll leave it to you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, there's so much to talk about, but I think that I want to start from, from a permission to narrate. Facts do not stand on their own. This is what Saeed told us. Unfortunately, as you, you can see here, uh, the killing is, everybody can see it, but somehow we do not count. And the question is who counts and why is a major question here. And I think that the fact that we do not count, the fact that the entire world is able to see, and the fact that the Palestinians are not, this is why like my, my entire production or my entire analysis on unchilding goes there. Our children are political capital in the hands of the state, but the state does not look at those children, at our children. They can arrest a six-year-old because he threw a stone. They can arrest and look at, you know, you were talking, uh, Nadia, on, about the so-called mixed cities, of course, and Haifa, where I was born uh, as, as a mixed city. Uh, look at the amount of arrests. Inside 48, over 1,200 people were arrested. 
look at yesterday inside the court, 16 year old, 17 year old are standing there. So the situation is seen there because we spoke out. You look at Jerusalem, Jerusalem 11 and 12, and the situation is very, very messy. So it's not, it's, and, and add to all this that not only that we do not count, not only so as much as we speak, somehow uh, the sacralization of politics or uh, as you know, my, my colleague Nadim Rahan and I just published a book three days ago, it came out, it's called When Politics is Sacralized. It really talks about the fact that in Zionism, there's something about this, this the movement that it's about you know the sacred and the profane, the supremacy of one group. So if God gave them the land and we are in this land, so we need to be erased. So the sacralization, of uh, politics is hard at work. When Palestinians do not count, our children are no children, uh, fathers are, non, are unfathered, parents are, um, and the killing is not counted because let me remind all of us that the, the bombs and the machinery and the artillery that is used in Gaza is being sold as combat proven to countries, yeah? And those countries are buying it from Israel and Israel is living and on this technology. So the political economy of who counts when and how and whose voice is, is really uh, taken into consideration is a major issue. And therefore trauma is not any trauma because it's number one, we were as Palestinians, maybe I should start there, evicted from the trauma genre because the trauma genre only included the pain of some groups and we were like totally outside yeah now that we are in the tendency is to pathologize and individualize and what we are calling as trauma scholars as, as people that are working in mental health is that it's number one it's an, it's a continuous cumulative trauma that we need to look at you know the work of, of Lara Shiha and Istvan Shiha speaks volume to this so we need to look at the way we become a combat proven uh, element for the state and we need to look at the effect of this trauma on Palestinians but we really need to look in order to understand this trauma we also need to take into consideration the power of livability and the fact that Palestinians that are in, in my work on unchilding, I insist on the power of children to interrupt states and childing. And maybe I'll, I'll say one more word that I want us to keep because what we see, the mobs that are dancing on our graveyards, the inability, our inability to bury our beloved ones because we need to take a permit from an Isra a doctor who has an Israeli uh, a, a permit and we need to get their permission to bury our beloved ones in our graveyards. So it's not only about the killability of the Palestinian while alive, it's also the killability while dead. So this necropenology, yeah, the, the, the penalizing the dead is hard at work. And when you juxtapose it with our everydayness, it is about the ability to walk to school. So my work uh, when looking at the seven to eight in the morning when kids are, are on their way to school. It's about livability, the ability to reach a hospital, the ability to bury a loved one, the ability to find a job. These are important things. So it is, you know, as you say, the devil in the details, it's the way they're controlling their surveillance, their machinery of oppression that, that is penetrating everything. But at the same time, dealing with the trauma is by also our togetherness and belonging and helping that requires today really a global political stand, a global political stand against what is going on. Otherwise, Israel can continue because we do not count. Thank you. Um, there, there are two questions from the audience, and I'm, I'm wondering if those of you who are understanding a global, an increased or intensified global um, support for Palestine um, might think about this because they, these questions have to do with the articulation, we might say in a Gramscian sense of Palestine with other emergent 
um, social issues. One is Palestine and blackness. Uh, the other one is um, Palestine as operate, does Palestine operate within a decolonial framework? Uh, is it odd to talk about decolonial uh, given that Palestine is still so intensively colonized, but a decolonial in the sense of, um, of operating within and against the colonial power, um, if there's to be coexistence or one state solution or even a, a peaceable um, two state one, um, wouldn't there have to be fundamental changes? Wouldn't there have to be a decolonial uh, restructuring of empire? So those are two questions that I've paraphrased from, from the audience. Uh, Esmat, do you, do you wanna take this? Uh, sure, I mean, there's no doubt that uh, any just solution to the problem in Palestine, which is to say freedom for Palestinians, is going to require not only a global movement, but a recognition of precisely uh, the global conditions of Palestinian on freedom and Zionist colonization. We have to understand the Zionist movement as drawn from precisely the same wells of imperial ideas, imperial institutions, and imperial money as the colonization of the world uh, that was done by the Americans, by the British, by the French, and so on, right? So it's a, you have to understand this as linked to uh, an imperial system, both uh, the expropriation of land and the uh, sorry, I just muted myself. And um, so that there's no doubt about that. And that's an important opportunity, I think, for people thinking about Palestine today, because it's precisely what a lot of uh, writers, activists, organizers around the world are putting front and center when they think about their own freedom. I mean, when young Black activists in the US are burning down police stations and calling out the United States, that's not just a uh, attack on present police activity and uh, you know, the, the violence of um, the day to day, that's an attack on the United States and the very thing that makes the US uh, nation state. So I think it's important to recognize that when Palestinians are attacking uh, the Israeli nation state, the idea of it and its uh, place uh, or and its role as, its, as their expropriator, they're doing so in similar terms as other people in Latin America and parts of Asia and parts of Africa and in the United States. So that's crucial, drawing those links that indigenous activists are drawing uh, in North and South America with Palestine is crucial. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, and, you know, I, I'll quote because, you know, this ostensibly is about Saeed. There's a remarkable essay he wrote, I think in 77 or 76, Parts of it gets get folded into um, uh, Zionism from the standpoint of its victims, but not all the fiery language. And I think this is peak of his language in terms of recognizing, uh, of course, he has a particular style and I happen to like it. Um, the, the, it and it's about Zionism and imperialism, the essay. And he writes, I'll quote, Thus a marriage was made between modern science and imperialism, whose consequence was untold catastrophe, human misery beyond count, oppression unlimited, disaster unqualified. Blacks, yellows, browns were declared non-people, their territory legislated away, their status by a stroke of the pen destroyed utterly. They were confined as the Indians were confined in reservations, or as the blacks in Bantustans, as also during the same period, women were confined to their homes, delinquents to prisons, the insane to asylums and hospitals. For imperialism is not only conquest, it is also a system of confinement and of hiding people declared unfit from history itself. And, um, you know, I, I often turn to that essay in part because of the language, but in part because it speaks so much endlessly to precisely these questions that are always coming up. This is the world that 
was made. Palestine holds a mirror to the third world, Iqbal Ahmed said in Gaza when he gave his uh, address there. And it's understanding that, as Saudi was talking about, precisely this sort of the idea of Palestine uh, that can be quite useful, I think, as we move along. Thank you very much. Um, you could ask that question of everyone, but I want uh, to pose a, a question from the audience to Nadia. Um, do you see also a danger in adopting the contrary view on uh, the Nekba? Yes, the Nekba and we Israelis care. Uh, we can imagine a liberal Zionist answer. Yes, I recognize Palestinian suffering. I'm even open to a land acknowledgement statement but there's no imperative to change anything, right? There can be forgiveness, acknowledgement, et cetera. Liberal Zionists feel better about themselves since they aren't racist like religious extremists and those engaged in mob violence, but they aren't willing to confront their Zionist privilege, much less the structure of Zionism itself. Um, I feel that this liberal attitude toward the Nekba is more dangerous since it still projects the ideological fantasy of Israel as a democracy. So. That's one question for Nadia. And sorry, here's a brief question for you. In some Arab countries, there's a romance of Palestine. They love the Palestinians. They, they affirm Palestine, but they've not done anything concretely politically to help or assist. And in fact, at key moments throughout history, the 20th century, they have uh, proven to be uh, absent and precisely at moments when, they, when their support was needed. Can that imaginary of Palestine also work to um, uh, confirm complicity uh, among nations who are uh, purportedly uh, pro-Palestine? Um, I guess I'll start. Um, yeah, absolutely. And that's why I sort of, well, let me say by, start by saying, in fact, when I started thinking about what it means to say, yes, the Nakba, but eh, so what? I wasn't actually thinking about the right. I was thinking about people who are liberals uh, in an Israeli political context or centrist to left liberals, um, like Ari Shavit, which is, and that's where I think the shift from absolute denial to something else. And Sadi, I also agree. I'm not saying denial is completely disagree, disappeared. I just think we have these different trends. You know, a kind of labor Zionist in the 60s and 70s would have said, no, 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 we never expelled anybody. Now it's much more common to say, yeah, 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 we did it. But, you know, to establish a Jewish majority in Palestine, that's what it takes. To have a nation state of your own, that's what it takes. Yes, I feel incredibly guilty. And, you know, Shavit's book has a whole narrative of trauma, which really is the trauma of the perpetrator, right? It's like the self, what Alan Young once called the self-traumatizing perpetrator, that the, the militia, you know, these were all sort of mainstream you know, labor types who did this in, in Linda, um, they all suffered from having done what they did, but they never regretted that they had to do it, right? So for me, it's not, I would just wouldn't frame that as caring. I still think they don't care. They pretend to care, but they care only insofar as it says something about themselves as liberal subjects and their concern with their own pain, whatever true or I mean, sincere or insincere pain. But I put that in the same category as no, they don't care. And I, and, I, and I agree in some sense, I think that is more dangerous. I mean, it, I think it's a different version of the, yes, we, the Nekba, but we Israelis don't care. And I think it is more dangerous. And I think it's the combination of those two, um, both of, which, of the kind of right-wing guy who will say, yeah, whatever, we need to do this. And the sort of more liberal position that has pain over quote unquote pain over the Nekba, but doesn't care enough to say that it requires a political solution. Having said that, I guess I would say two things. The two state solution is precisely that, which is, eh, yeah, the Nekba was wrong, but too late, moving on. We're not really gonna confront it. But I guess what I just wonder going forward is as things, again, this I think what Nadra was saying is these arrests have continued of Palestinian citizens of Israel, the mobs, right, the quote unquote mobs that went into the cities were organized on WhatsApp and on Telegram. These weren't, these weren't random events. They weren't like, they didn't suddenly emerge. They were told when to come, where to come, what weapons to bring, what to attack. 
I think as those things converge and this sort of anxiety rises about, we can't even trust our own Palestinian citizens, then the question is that Shavit kind of position gonna move again? Is it gonna move again to sort of incorporate what is more fully identified as, as or you know, as the right, well, the right wing, which is now 72 members of the Israeli parliament, let's keep in mind. Um, so yes, no, I think it's incredibly dangerous. It's a different version of the liberal state, quote unquote. Thank you. Um, sorry, can you perhaps talk a little bit about um, the, the, the possible dangers of uh, this ideal of, of Palestine, um, especially among Arab, Arab nations and surrounding uh, countries that, that claim to love Palestine, but don't do anything to support it. And then I think perhaps David Goldberg will come back on to conclude our, our event today. Um, yeah, that's that's an important question. I just want to just before I talk about that, just super super quickly, just to go back to what Nadia just said. I wonder, Nadia, about the exportability of that model of liberal Zionism. In other words, I, it seems to me that that's something that works in an Israeli context. I don't know that they can export it so successfully. I I could be wrong. Can I say one thing? Yeah. Um, Shavit's book was reviewed in the New Yorker and the New York Review of Books and the New York Times as the most powerful and sincere ethical reckoning with Zionism. All right, that's and Lida was the central chapter. Yeah. So I don't know. I think it's harder to the death to the Arabs. But the other thing to keep in mind, which you know better than me, I mean, denial is still there. Again, I think these things are happening. So, but also what is said in Hebrew and what is said in English is not always the same thing. But the liberal Americans completely embrace this book. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, do it just, sorry, just in response to that question about the Arabs. I mean, I think anytime we talk about Palestine and the Arab world, the we have to remember there's a distinction between Arab people, Arab citizens, and Arab states. They're not the same thing, right? And so the support for Palestine among Arab normal Arab people, I mean, citizens of all the Arab states, has always been strong, will always be strong. That's not going anywhere. When you, again, when you just look at Yemen. Yemen, which is being bombed, besieged, bombarded, starved, you know, everything else by the Saudis and the UAE. Even in Yemen, they, they've had, I don't know, 100,000 people, whatever it was, marching in the street for Palestine when, when Gaza was being bombed. That's, that's, and then there were, pro, there were of course, there were protests to the, to the border in Lebanon and in Jordan and other countries as well. The support, what's interesting, I think here's, you know, and I, we need a proper historian to do this. Asma, this could be for you, maybe. Um, is the relationship between the 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 anti-democratic energy of, of of so many Arab states and the question of Palestine? And it was what how, to what extent are those things related? Because there's no question in my mind that the the popular support for Palestine and the Palestinian cause and the Palestinian people among Arabs in the so-called Arab street has has never wavered for a moment. Whereas, of course, complicity among various Arab regimes. And, and of course, their attempt to use Palestine as a kind of football over the over the years, that's undoubtedly true. But I think we have to separate regimes from people. At the level of the people, there's no, no question that support for Palestine is as strong as it's ever been. Um, Nader, are you wanting to perhaps say something on one of the earlier questions? Yes, yes, I actually wanted to pick up on your question regarding Black Lives Matter and stress that what we are learning and why we are engaging as Palestinians with Black Lives Matter is exactly the radical politics. This is why looking at the movement today, looking at the writing before, engaging with Fanon as someone that I, for example, embed my work looking at racism, understanding how racism is really part embedded in the Zionist machinery of oppression. And when I look at the case of George Floyd and I compare it to, for example, the case of Zohdi, Zohdi was killed in Sheikh Jarrah, you know, like the fact, and I'm, I'm working with my colleague, Shirin Raza, who wrote a wonderful book on dying from improvement. And I think what is happening to Palestinians here is a mode of dying from improvement, but it's a different way. But what we're looking at is not only the killing, it's the, the overkilling. You know, Zohdi not only was killed, he was handcuffed while dead. Like just to look at his body and he is on the floor, 
in the middle of the street while handcuffed. How do you read the state from that scene? So our, our connection to Black Lives Matter is exactly here in radical analysis and radical politics. And decolonization is not because Palestine is being decolonized, but rather learning from your work, Judith, from the work of my colleague, Leila Abu Lohod, in understanding how to call thing, how to frame it, looking at Nadia's work and learning from it, how to really be able to narrate in a different way in order to try to make sense of the nonsense that is going on. So yes, Black Lives Matter is Palestine Lives Matter and George Floyd is part of us and understanding and learning from different scholars is there. David Theo Goldberg's book on, on, on Israel as a racial state was, it was a long time ago. And, and, and we really need to go back and read and understand. And, but we really, I want to insist on the need today for in this moment for global political movement. We see it in Kashmir when they're supporting us, we see, but we really need much more in order to not continue the, the Nakba the way it is now. Well, thank you very much. I, I think that does probably conclude our formal discussion. I, I, there was um, one person who, who made the remark, let's make sure whatever global solidarity movement we uh, develop includes the global South. It can't just be a solidarity among the colonizers. Thank you for that uh, reminder, crucial given what the support is throughout Latin America for Palestine. Um, uh, thank you for letting me moderate. David, um, do you want to say goodbye to us? Thank you, Judith, so much. An extraordinary moderator for an extraordinary panel. Uh, this has really been deeply insightful, if uh, as deeply sobering, uh, from the questions about narration to politics on the ground, uh, concerns around refusal, uh, and uh, the struggle to go on. I mean, if we are to draw on the global south, I'm reminded, literally in the second, of a luta continua, right? Uh, the, um, Mozam uh, the Mozambican sort of undertaking um, to continue the struggle collectively. Uh, I want to thank you all. This has been extraordinary. I think the people who joined us will concur. Uh, we will uh, publish uh, a recording of this uh, on our website, which got hacked last night. So it was done overnight. Uh, we think we got targeted. Um, but we, we, we will be up before the end of the day and uh, uh, over the next week we'll, we'll be uh, publishing this recording uh, to be thank, thank you so very much and stay well and healthy everybody, thank you. <laughs>